We're going to start with a video, though. By the ch you never get to watch these things in church, so let's just take advantage of it. A few people have tried it. Nobody has ever managed to get anywhere close to what we got like today. You have to believe you can do these things. It's not like impossible. There's been a few people that have been like sort of following us. It's me, my boots and I, we're going to make it. I definitely think it's going to be the next big thing. Liquid mountaineering is actually a oops brainchild. It's a new sport. It was not existing before. You have to run very fast on the water. I mean, obviously the first step was the most important one. When we like discovered, we're going one step, we're going two steps, we're going three steps. We're discovering it as we go along. While we're still on land, we try to get up really speed. Soon we, we touch the water, we try to get like, like a sewing machine. It's not straight into the water, you know. In a curve, in a slight curve. And by that bend, you're actually not allowing yourself to sink into the water and you want to keep that skimming sensation going as long as you can. Bonjour. What gets us those extra steps are these shoes. The, the original equipment where it first all started was the equipment that would help repel water. We found some shoes by mistake, actually. Totally water repellent. It's like water off a duck's back. It takes actually a lot of practice, a lot of focus. I think if you don't actually believe that you're going to walk on that water, it's not going to happen for you. working on a jet ski system, obviously that pulls us into the water with a bit more speed. Be with yourself, believe in it. It's not about the miracle, it's just go for it. Try to do it, if you fall down, Try again. People want you to think in a certain way, and, and, and this sport actually allows you to push your horizons further. It's just, it's not boxing you in and saying, that's what you are. You're just like, you're moving past it all. All right. Pretty cool. When I showed this first time President Barron, he was sitting there and says, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I said, it's all fake. And he says, dang it, I hate being global. This is all fake. None of it's real, right? They just did this for a commercial to see how many shoes they could sell. And they actually did it as a spoof. And they sold millions of shoes. And they have people writing in a month later saying, I'm up to three steps. It's only been a few weeks. <laughs> You can't walk on water, nor can you run on water. So they got a dock made of glass and they put weights on it so that it floated just two inches above the water and then that's what they did to do that spoof. Now, why am I talking about that? Because you guys live in a fascinating world. You see these? That's lacquer. That's the same stuff you put on wood to make sure that it doesn't ever go bad. If you look at these uh, ads like that, that's motor oil because motor oil looks a lot better. It doesn't soak into the pancakes. In fact, the pancakes are sprayed with fabric protector to make a good picture. Your world that you live in, the, the lines between what is real and what is not are so blurred that I suspect you don't even know the difference and you don't know you don't know the difference. This hit me like crazy when I had my eight-year-old daughter. We watch Harry Potter as a family over this uh, Christmas break, like all 7,200 hours of it. <laughs> and my eight-year-old daughter always has to say to me, is that real? No. Is that real? No. Because those things look amazing. The dragons and everything. And you guys are thinking, eh, I know it's not real. 
Oh, I wouldn't. I wonder. I wonder with your brains. In fact, if you notice a little child, the first time they watch TV at some point when you get to this age, you're going to see the little child walk up to the television and look behind it. Because they're going to try to figure out what it is they're watching. Because their brains are saying that's an object, but it's also a person. And I don't understand the difference. So I must walk up and figure out where's the person. Your brains have already made that connection. Okay? Now, let's talk about this question. Why do we like this stuff so much? Why do we like sweets? Why do we like pornography? Why do we like excitement? We want so badly to run across that water. What is it that creates us, that allows that? And I have a question. Why did God design us like this? I mean, if you're a guy and you're thinking, why in the heck do I have such an attraction to women? Why would God do this to me? And your girl, you're like, yeah, why would he? <laughs> okay. Is it an imperfect design or an incomplete design? My hypothesis is that it's an incomplete design, not an imperfect design, and I want to talk about it. Okay? But I want to base my comments on this quote today from Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith says, and I highlighted the, the stuff that's really neat in yellow, he says, God has designed our happiness and the happiness of all His creatures. Everything that God gives us is lawful and right, and it is proper that we should enjoy His gifts and blessings whenever and wherever he is disposed to bestow, bestow, which is fascinating. But then this next quote, But if we should seize upon those same blessings and enjoyments without law, without revelation, without commandment, those blessings and enjoyments would prove cursings and vexations in the end. And this is what I would like to talk about. I'm going to use a theme around chastity today and pornography, but I want you to recognize the same things that I'm teaching you work for any addiction in your brain. What is an addiction? Simply put, when consequences don't matter. That's my definition. If you want to lose weight and you eat a jelly donut and you know you shouldn't, you're addicted to food. If you choose to sleep rather than to do your church responsibilities, you're addicted could be depression, same kinds of addictions. If you choose to play video games over studying, etc., the consequences, you have an addiction. None of us are exempt from this. I've probably eaten 300 pounds of chocolate over the last few days. I know. <laughs> I have to screen all my kids' candy to make sure it's not poison. So that's one bite a piece. <laughs> but I want you to understand something. I'm not coming from a hypocritical standpoint saying, you look at me, I'm not addicted. I understand addictions. You have to come to terms with it. All of us have these predisp predispositions to become addicted to anything. I want to teach you why it happens today, and more importantly, if it's happened to you, how to fix it. Using the brain, okay? So, I'm going to talk about this particular subject. This is a human. I don't have a laser pointer. I'll just use the mouse. It's a human guy, and it's got a brain. The outline here is the nervous system. Now, we're not any different than anything else, though, with our nervous system. In fact, if you just looked at our nervous system, we'd be similar to this grasshopper. It's got a nice nervous system and a brain. A dog, it's got this nice little nervous system. What makes the human unique? We have all the same desires, but humans have one area that's unique. Right here in the front. This brain is turned sideways, okay? So if you turn me like this, this is, this is my brain, this would be your eyeball. We have regions of our brain that allow us to override instinct. Let me state that another way. If you take a starving animal and you put food in front of the starving animal, they'll eat it. You can take a starving human and you can put food in front of a starving, starving human and if that human wants, they can choose not to eat it. Most humans. <laughs> Same with sex. You can present the opportunity to an animal, they will seize it. To a human, we can override it. Most humans. 
unless we have lost that capacity. That capacity is in our frontal cortex. It's what I call our agency or our ability to override our instincts. What I would like to talk today is how to create that, how to foster that, and what happens when you lose that. Because Satan's whole goal is to take this from you, to take this ability, this God-given ability to take it from you. Remember, it's an incomplete design though. This area takes 26 years to fully develop. 26. Perhaps this is why all of our prophets are really old. It takes a long time to get that processing. And if you partake of things without law, you will increase the time of that processing center. Okay? All right. We're going to jump into a different kind of... Oh, thanks. We're going to jump into a different kind of a process here. Ooh, look, our laser pointer. Now we're in close to the brain. If you look at the brain itself, it's just made up of little wires. They're funny looking things called neurons. Okay? Um, I want to draw your attention, not the best resolution, to these things right here. Okay? This is how you form thought and memory in your brain. If you want to create a thought, the first time you hear a lot of these terminology, you might get a little process sticking out here. By the time you leave today, that'll be gone and you'll never remember it. Ideally, school teaches you how to grow neurons so they create these nice um, synapses or junctions right here. The closer it is to this big structure, the better the memory. Okay? That's all you have to understand in terms of memories. When we learn something, we usually make a, a connection out here. Then when we get something processed more where we don't forget it, it's in here. These represent very strong impressions, very strong memories. Okay? Oh, I can move around and just push this button? Oh, is that going to mess up your recording? I'd prefer to stand over here. I want to show you what it looks like in the brain. Okay, that's supposed to be a little play thing. We're close. I want to show you an actual image of neurons forming the brain, memories. Okay, you can hear the MRI machine in the background. These are those, this is the big neuron. These are all the processes. We're going to zoom in here. I'm going to show you them actually growing right here. These are memories forming in an actual brain right there. We're going to get closer here. I'm going to show you how, what this looks like as these processes grow in and out, in and out. This is time elapsed, sped up really quick, but this is your brain forming memories, forming actions, etc. And that's pretty cool. That's your actual brain, not yours, because I couldn't scan you. But... This is the analogy I like to use. I believe God has given us a small seed or tree. This is, looks like to me a brain, all these different branches. This is your incomplete design. Notice how full it is, but it's very tiny. Our objective is to create this. This is what we must do. God does not give you this. This is your process to create this nice full tree or your brain processing. It says everything that God gives us is lawful and right and is proper that we should enjoy His gifts and blessing whenever and wherever He is disposed to bestow. But this could be your brain. But if we should seize upon those same blessings and enjoyments without law, without revelation, without commandment, those blessings and enjoyments would prove cursings and vexations in the end. This is called a flag tree, and it's had a lot of abuse over the years. This is not a good processing brain. It's leaning to one side. We can't even process over here. This kind of brain is broken, and you might not even understand that your brain looks like this, because if you're the person with this brain, it all seems normal. But other people can look at you and say, that is not normal. So let's take a look at what happens with our brains, okay? Really, this is that picture I showed you of the two neurons back and forth. It's all about these little triangles binding to these things. I'm going to give you some names of this. I don't want to bore you with too much biology. But that's a receptor. And that receptor interacts with those things. I'm not even going to tell you the name triangles. <laughs> okay? It's all about those. When you form a memory, a thought, or behavior, this is what you're modifying. The interaction between this 
this and how much of those you dump. For example, now this is my stick figure mode of the same picture. Okay? Here's the little neuron coming and it's going to release some dots. Okay? Little yellow dots and those yellow dots are going to interact here with this thing and send a signal somewhere else. That's your processing. Okay? Here are my little Pac-Mans. These are the receptors. They have to interact with these little yellow dots and create a response. So let's look at the response. All right? Remember, I'm going to use pornography as my lead-in to help you understand how the brain processes. But it does, this is the same for any processing thing. Okay? Anything. Any habitual thing that you create, this is how it works. Here's a picture of our modestly dressed woman. What kind of response do we get with that? We get a few of these little neurotransmitters, we get a signal and a reward at the end. Okay? There we go. Now, what happens if we dress her down a little bit? In a guy's brain who's very visual, the largest portion of a man's brain is the occipital lobe back here, the very back. This is a visual processing center and it's gigantic in men. The design is such, I don't know why, but that was our design we're given. If we're not careful, let me show you what happens. When you see a woman that's dressed down, well, you get more dots. The first time I gave you four dot, four, or two little yellow dots, now I've given you four. Much bigger response, much bigger reward. Get the old Andrew Jackson. Okay. Now, if we go one more step further and we dress her down even more, men are very visual we get a lot of release and a very big reward and BAM! Benjamin Franklin. But you'll notice something. This stimulus has left a lot of neurotransmitter yellow dots unbound. What's the brain going to do in response to this? It's going to take a look and say, hmm, we've got a lot of excess here. The brain hates that. Your body hates that. So it says, I know how to fix this. I'm going to add more, dot, more receptors. Then, when you get the response, kabam, boom, and we get a nice big response. Okay? The problem is, now you take a brain that has been altered. Okay? This was not the initial design. This is a new design that you have created because of what you're partaking. This is what we do. Don't take the you as being me pointing fingers at you, just a way of expressing it. But if you've taken the time to create this in your brain, let me show you what's going to happen when you go back to a normal system. You've got all of these transmitters, sorry, receptors. Now we go back to a normally dressed, modest woman who gives us our two little neurotransmitters. We barely even notice the signal and we find no pleasure in that whatsoever. This is called desensitization. And desensitization is a very real thing. If you partake of things, even food, to move it outside of pornography, if all you eat is those high intensity jelly donuts, you can create in your brain this kind of a system where normal food is not exciting. This is why the food manufacturers make so much money redesigning products. Constantly redesigning to make sure that our brains don't relax so that we keep getting a stimulus. All right? Desensitization. Now, I want to show you something else with this diagram. So I'm back here. I've got this neuron here. I want to draw your attention right there. Let's suggest that this neuron was designed for you based on your partaking of those images of a female that were dressed down. You have spent so much time on here, you've got a nice connection. Very solid, right to the body of this. Bam! What happens is other things that aren't necessarily associated with that one, but are also associated here. Let's say, for example, you play video games, and sometimes the video games have differently dressed or inappropriately dressed girls on it. It's going to create a synapse in the same area of the brain. If you get access on your cell phone, it's going to create a synapse in the same area of the brain. 
What this means is, this is a concept called sensitization. Every time you reach into your pocket to grab your phone, what's going to happen is this neuron is going to turn on. And if this neuron turns on, guess what it starts craving? Input from other things. Even playing a video game, which normally could be harmless, could create a stimulus where you start to crave that. That's called sensitization. Any activity associated even remotely will start creating a problem. Okay? You've got to keep these things in mind because this will help you overcome it later on. All right, one other thing. Let's talk about pre-mission brains. Here's the brain again, stick figure mode. Let's say before our mission we partake in no, uh, most normal teenage things. So R-rated movies, hopefully it's not normal, but YouTube, music lyrics, girls and flirting, those seems pretty, that seems pretty normal. We're going to create, remember, we have an in, incomplete design left to us to complete the design. We partake in these things. What happens? Well, we get uh, fun. Feels good. Body loves to learn and experience new things. Okay? This frontal cortex, the thing that makes us unique as humans, is not fully functioning. It takes 26 years, pre-mission, 16, 17, 18. This isn't really going to help contribute at all. The result? You get this uh, addiction to these kinds of things, and there's really nothing saying it's wrong. You do get this that says, it feels sort of wrong because so-and-so has told me not to do that, etc., etc. Well, th what happens during your mission? This goes away. Typically on your mission, you're not doing no stuff. So that area becomes dormant. Doesn't go away, becomes dormant. It's still there. I'm going to repeat that because it seems to be a concept that's lacking. It's still there. It just simply has become dormant. We start doing other things on our mission, like scriptures, thinking of others, etc., etc. We create another part of our brain, and guess what? That part feels pretty good, too. We love learning that stuff. And this frontal cortex, because we're getting older, starts to develop, the fancy word is myelination, and we start to be able to decipher correctly between what's wrong and what's right. It's still not 100% there, but we've been working on this for a while. So what happens? We come home off our mission. If we immediately start to do the same stuff that we were doing before, bam! It comes right back with a vengeance, and now we've got a competing interest in our brain, which the brain hates doing that. It's so difficult, it's almost exhausting and the frontal cortex is functioning. Not fully functioning, but pretty darn close. What's the result? What I'm doing is right and wrong, and I know it. But it feels good to choose wrong, it feels good to choose right, but now you have to choose wrong actively against those feelings. The result is, whoa, the addiction becomes much worse. brain reverts back to the before mission status, it's worse because now you have to act actively ignore it. This is a problem. The more you partake of this sort of thing, the less you're going to get input from here. And when you don't have input from your frontal cortex, that's an addiction. And that's a loss of agency. And a loss of agency is the inability to choose. And if you remember, like we should, I don't remember, but I was taught this, I fought pretty hard in a pre-existence for my agency. And Satan's fighting pretty hard right now to take it from me. Fourth thing that happens, when we get our brains that aren't quite functioning, we have issues with this sort of thing. Stress can be summarized in five things. It's an acronym called BLAST or college. Boredom. <laughs> Lonely, anger, stress, tired. This is something you will never, ever get rid of. Your entire life will be fighting these kinds of things. But if you have a dysfunctional stress circuit, because of the design that you've taken from Heavenly Father and redesigned yourself, every time you experience one of these things, you will go to your addiction. It's the simple way to go. New research suggests we have a limited capacity to withstand our dysfunctional brains. Okay, if we have time, I'll explain that. But these are huge triggers. 
for any kind of addiction. If you suffer from a depression, this will trigger you. If you suffer from overeating, this will trigger you. If you suffer from video games, trigger. Pornography, trigger. Trigger. Fake book, trigger. Right? I don't call it by its real name because it's not real. So any of those things are going to mess you up by these dysfunctional stress circuits. Okay. Is it working? Well, this is a map of the United States. Here's Idaho. We're right here. This is Utah. You do not want to be dark in this map. This map represents the number per thousand of pornographic subscriptions per household. Mississippi, Utah, okay? 2005 data. It's probably worse now, but I couldn't find the newer data. Nobody's done it yet. Is it working? Absolutely. Why is it so difficult to avoid? I'm going to give you four things, and then I'm going to give you some hope. Number one, it's extreme novelty. Your brain loves new things. If you look at products, for example, the Nabisco Cracker Company. Okay, ooh, that was recorded. Anyways, Nabisco came out with a cracker brand that said pizza-flavored wheat thins, and they tanked because it sounds gross. I don't know who thought that would be a good idea. But they bring it back, they go to the marketing guy and say, that was a bad idea, you fix it. So he comes back out and he re-entitles re it tomato basil. And rocket, they go rocket through the air. Same flavor, different marketing, because we love new stuff. Coke Zero, Diet Coke, same kind of example, okay? Advertising agencies feed off of this, and so does internet pornography. It's novel. With one click, two click, three click, you can click hundreds of times and never see the same thing. That is one of the best teaching tools you can come up with. Unfortunately, it's one of the best teaching tools you can come up with. Limitless exposure. In terms of internet pornography, you have access 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you have internet anytime, anywhere. This is why America has a huge problem with overeating because food is prevalent everywhere. Everywhere you look, you can get food. If you want a chocolate today, I know you could find it. And if you wanted internet pornography today, you can find it. Right now, right here, you could do it if you wanted. And that makes it almost incredibly difficult or impossible to avoid. There's also this concept called lack of an aversion mechanism. Normally somebody might consider this to be a dangerous thing. <laughs> but pornography doesn't have it. What this means is if you have an eating disorder you will get to the point where you can't eat anymore because you're gonna get hurting. Your stomach's gonna hurt. Internet pornography has nothing like that. You can look at internet pornography for hours and hours and hours and never have any inclination to stop. In fact, your frontal cortex will shut down so much you won't even know how long you've been looking. And this has been asked, how long do you think you spent on there? Oh, I don't know, 15 minutes? Four and a half hours. That's amazing how the big the difference is for what they think that they were on there and how they're actually on there because there's no aversion mechanism. What else? it always escalates to more and more extreme pornography because you create receptors and if those receptors are not being filled up your brain craves more always is going to go to more and more always associated with things like masturbation because that adds another component the brain craves that it also creates some issues in the other parts of the brain that you're ignoring because the other parts of the brain are not being fed we get lack of social confidence and social anxiety and this is fascinating when you think about it because an internet iPad or phone for example has no agency this is no agency which means if I want this phone if I want to look at some a naked woman on this phone she'll let me anytime I want but then you move into real people and they aren't like that especially if you take that into marriage. Can you imagine? I've heard it all the time. Guys say, well, I struggle with pornography now. When I get married, it'll be better because I'll be able to have sex whenever I want. And I'm like, she's not a phone. She has agency. But you can get so messed up, that's what you'll think marriage is about. Woo! 
Then you get this problem, which is your tastes stop matching your sexual orientation. You start really preferring other things, like if you're a guy, maybe another guy, or worse, children. And you wonder how people could ever do such disgusting things. Well, they never start that way. They start small, and it just escalates, and suddenly you realize you're here. And, of course, you lose other parts of your brain. Let me take a moment just to tell you how easy it is to go here with a story from my life, not about pornography, but about dead people. Since I am a biologist and a human physiologist, I've had a lot to do with dead people. In fact, the first class that I ever took in graduate school was a human cadaver anatomy class. I walked into a room about this size. There were 20 silver tables, all with bodies on them of humans. Now, the first time you walk into an experience like that, you're going to say, whoa. There's nothing in your brain to prepare you for that. You don't even have any dendrites. You're just like, oh, and it's so shocking. And then I look over in the corner, and who is sitting there? The TA, and he's eating lunch. <laughs> and I said, no way. That will never be me. I remember saying that. That guy is messed up. I did this whole school. Within a month or so, the sh initial shock of walking into all those bodies didn't even bother me. In fact, the smell was normal. I'd go eat lunch next to people and I would smell like the cadavers and people were just like, oh my gosh. I wouldn't even notice. But the real censure about, I don't know, 10 years after that initial exposure, and I'd been teaching about human bodies for such a long time, I was invited by a company to go to San Francisco to review a new dissection computer program where they dissected humans real live humans, not live, but real humans. <laughs> that would be bad. The humans were dead, and they dissected them, and they took pictures, and then they wanted us to, as, a, as a committee to review it and see if it was valid. Well, there was about eight people from around the nation invited, and we were watching this on a PowerPoint presentation just like this, eating dinner, eating steak. not even bothered. And what happened? This waitress walks in, she sets down my dessert, looks at the screen and goes, ooh, and takes off running out. And I was like, oh, no, how did this happen? I was like, no, I'll tell you how it happens. I watch it all the time. So let me tell you, let me, let me put it into your terms. The first time you hold hands with a girl, even if you interdigitate, <laughs> you're going to create some interesting neural junctions. You're going to be like, this is amazing. I think I love him or her. But after like holding hands for a week or so, it's just like, eh, it's not doing it for me. I don't love you. So what happens? You kiss. Wow. Firecrackers, new neurons. That's oh, amazing. I'm in love. And then it goes away. Because you create some solid neurons, no problem. So what do you do? You add touching. You add something else like laying on top. And you keep justifying it because your frontal cortex says, oh, I can do this. This is OK. I haven't exceeded this line. Because your line keeps moving because your brain develops differently. And suddenly you find yourself breaking the law of chastity severely. And you say, wow, how did I get here? But you can sit in a lesson like this and say, I'll never do that. And then you find yourself in a restaurant eating steak or touching someone inappropriately before marriage. And you say, how did I get there? That's what I want to teach you about the brain. Now, also associated with this, because now you start noticing, I'm busted. I'm broken, and I don't know how to fix it. And I hate what I do, but I can't fix it. And that's where we find ourselves. And our brain is the culprit, because we did it. God didn't do it. God gave you initially a brain to work with, and then you have spent time creating your own problem, which now we've got to fix. From Elder Bednar.
Don't underestimate it. Most will think, I'm a good guy, it won't happen to me. To any man who thinks it can't happen to him, he's the most vulnerable. He'll have one experience where he comes in contact, casual contact with it and become addicted. Those who say it could happen to me are on guard. They'll work harder to stay away from it. This is serious stuff. I deal with it more and more all the time. All right, now the question. How do we beat it? Remember, not just internet pornography, but any addictive tendency. Whether it's eating, whether it's depression, whether it's Facebook, whether it's romance novels, whether it's internet pornography, whether it's video games, all of these fall into the same category. Now we can show you. The key is we play two things. We play defense, which we have been doing, but sometimes the emphasis is never put on offense. You've got to play offense or you cannot win, as BYU so eloquently illustrates for us. <laughs> okay? You have to play both offense and defense. Now, I want to show you a concept called the Zorro Circle. I'm going to watch a little bit of Zorro. Isn't this great on Sunday? Do you know how to use that thing? Yes. Point the end goes into the other man. This is going to take a lot of work. This is called a training circle, the master's wheel. This circle will be your world, your whole life. Till I tell you otherwise, there is nothing outside of it. Captain Love is... There is nothing outside of it. Captain Love does not exist until I say he exists. As your skill with the sword improves, you will progress to a smaller circle. With each new circle, your world contracts, bringing you that much closer to your adversary, that much closer to retribution. I like that part. Shall we? Lesson number two, come with me. What? So what is lesson number three? To get to lesson number four. That concept's called the Zorro Circle. Whenever you have to accomplish something very large, very big, so many of us make all the mistakes that, that this young Zorro makes. You want it all. You want to finish it. You want to take it down. But you must start very tiny with something you can control. This is the number one reason why people never keep New Year's resolutions. They create impossible standards. I'm going to lose 150 pounds in a month and a half. Ah! And what happens in about two and a half weeks? I haven't lost a single pound. This is lame. Forget it. Same thing with overcoming internet pornography. We will create impossible standards. And remember, your brain has a limited capacity to withstand temptation. They discovered that using chocolate chip cookies. They brought people into a room and they baked some freshly chocolate chip cookies and they sat them in there. They walk in the room, they smell the chocolate chip cookies and they say, just sit and work on this unsolvable puzzle. They didn't know it was unsolvable, but just take this thing that makes you think. Don't eat the cookies, by the way, but just sit here in this room and solve this. And by the way, Across the way, there's a, there's a high school group of high school students doing the same thing. So you're in college, they're in high school. Please show us what you can do. Put the stakes high. Can't eat the cookies. 
Then they measure how long it takes before they give up, how many attempts they make. Take another group just like it, put them in a room, no chocolate chip cookies, and they just let them do the thing. If you put them in a room with no chocolate chip cookies, you'll try about 40 times before you'll give up. If you have chocolate chip cookies in the room, you're going to try about 12 times before you give up. <laughs> because just trying to withstand that temptation will deplete you so that the rest of your brain no longer functions. Isn't that fascinating? The idea is to build up that tolerance. But here's the hope. I'm going to identify five things. Okay? Remember, this is recorded, so we don't have to panic too much. But there are really five behaviors that will help you overcome addictions. This is listed. I'll go through them one by one. Abstaining behaviors means eliminate access. Okay? You must eliminate it. We'll go back to internet pornography. If this is how you get internet pornography, then you must get rid of this. I don't know if I can repeat that enough times. Anytime someone comes to my office and says, I have an addiction to pornography, I'd like to stop, can you help me? And I say, sure. How do you get access? And they say, well, my phone. The next thing I do is I say, well, give me your phone. If they won't give me their phone, they will not beat their addiction. Even when I tell them that, face up, say, you will not beat it. You have your phone, you'll lose. Then they walk out, no, I won't. Uh, then they're back a month later. Well, how else can I do it? Give me your phone. And until they are ready to eliminate access, you cannot beat it. Because you're fighting against yourself. It's your own brain. When your brain decides it's time to feed that neural network, it will shut off all reason, increase justification, and you will succumb because it's your own brain. It's, a it's similar to trying to not go to sleep when you're really tired. It's brutal. But when your body decides it's time to go to sleep, it's your brain, you're a goner. You're going to go to sleep. Hopefully you're not driving somebody else. You must eliminate access. If it's the video game, chuck it. I'm telling you, $400 versus eternal marriage, you'd be surprised how many people will give up for, uh, eternal marriage for $400. Isn't that, isn't that funny? It's fascinating. But that's what they'll do. You can ask some people that are addicted straight up, what is it, marriage, family, or phone? And they will say to you, I will take the phone. Because your brain is busted. And that's their world of reasoning. Anchoring behaviors. For example, fasting. I did learn this from President Barron. He's big on this, taught me a valuable principle, which I've taken and added biology to it. All of these things, fasting, praying, dis disciplined. Remember, you have instincts in your nervous system, and instincts want you to take care of your body. They want you to not get up in the morning because it's way better to lay there. They want you to eat the, the candy and eat the sugar because it, it gives them much bigger fulfillment. They want you to do things that are easy. Watching television versus reading, duh. Broccoli versus donut, duh. Your nervous system is designed to give you the easiest route. That's what your design is. Protect the body. So you remember, you have this frontal cortex which gives you the ability to override your instinct. But how do you build the frontal cortex? What do you do? You allow it to work. This is the design of the gospel. It's beautiful. Who in the heck goes to three hours of church? Well, God has a body. He knows what to do. Anytime you withdraw or deny your body something it wants, you're strengthening your frontal cortex. Praying, very difficult, especially when you lay down at night in your warm covers and you're like, oh, I forgot to pray. So what do you do? You roll over and you stink bug it. You sort of do a half kneeling prayer and you put your bum in the air and you're like, can you imagine if, if, if Heavenly Father walked in your room and you're like, hey, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> but why, why don't we just get out of bed and do it? Because it's stinking hard, right? What if, what if church is at nine in the morning? You're like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, you got to take time. The best thing, so Zorro Circle, what's the one principle you can do right now to keep yourself and give your strength? That's it. Fast. Fast. 24 hours. 
Just fast. You have the ability. You're the only species on the planet that can withhold food when you're hungry. And the more you do that, the stronger it's going to become. Christ is the only individual who never gave in to temptation. Despite being faced with the opportunity, his frontal cortex never wore out. He is the only person that understands the true nature of temptation. As C.S. Lewis states, bad people know little, very little about being bad. They, they know very little about resisting temptation. An individual who gives in after five minutes simply does not know what it's going to be like an hour later. You don't understand strength until you learn to resist it. Replacement behaviors. If you're going to replace a bad habit, don't replace it with another bad habit. Bad habits are the easiest ones to build. You must find difficult things. Okay, These are some of mine that I bring up to help me exercise. Probably the greatest number one uh, addiction relief you can ever identify. Anti-depression, etc. Sports, motorcycles, anything. These are just some examples. Find anything. Take a sticky note out, write down all the things you can do on the sticky note, put the sticky note somewhere. When you find yourself bored, look at your sticky note. You must also contribute. Contribute are all unselfish. You'll notice one thing. Be unselfish. Being unselfish will help your cortex develop properly. Service, compliment others, do something every day that takes you you're out of your comfort zone a little bit so that you can create a more positive interaction with your frontal cortex. And finally, restructure it. This is the most difficult component. This is why we never make our diet rules or never make our New Year's resolutions because restructuring is hard. Your brain is not designed that way. You must restructure. All right? First thing, take some counsel from Elder Uchtdorf. Stop it. Just stop it. Start there. I also feel very, um, I have a pretty good testimony about what I call imaginative control. I can do this in one minute. Um, one of my passions is motorcycles. I love to ride motorcycles across the country. Last summer I went around the United States 10,365 miles. My son who's back here has gone 32,000 miles with me on a motorcycle. One of the things I would do to keep myself awake is daydream. I daydream about the Utah Jazz because I love basketball. And my daydream was kind of funny, but it would be like the Utah Jazz showed up here at BYU-Idaho campus. They watched faculty play. They thought, that guy's pretty good. They put me on the team, and I was amazing. I'd dunk it over Kobe Bryant, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And you could think there's nothing wrong with that because it's not inappropriate. But here's the problem. It's not real. There's nothing about it that's real. Positive reinforcement is valuable, but you must stay within reality. Daydreaming about winning the lottery and all the stuff you could do with the money is not real. Daydreaming about lifting weights and becoming gigantic like Arnold Schwarzenegger, probably not realistic. The problem when you do that is you create neural networks in your brain that will then become very easy for the rest of your brain to utilize. I found that when I would spend six or seven hours on a motorcycle dreaming up these imaginative type daydreams, when I would see a billboard that was inappropriate, I started having some problems controlling where my thoughts were running. And I thought, what is going on here? Whoa, what am I doing? I pinpointed it to this. And I took care of it. I said no. So on this 10,365 mile trip on my motorcycle, before I left, I generated about 27 doctrinal questions. And that's what I did. Sounds like a complete nerd. Well, it might be, but I did it. I visited those. You'd be amazing how many church talks I gave myself on that motorcycle ride. Sometimes I'd even start crying. I'm like, whoa, that was really touching. <laughs> okay. But I found something. When I got back or when I saw an inappropriate billboard, it was gone. It wasn't even there. It was just, boom. I'm like, ooh, bad picture. Look away. No desire to look back. No desire to visit again. I was like, yes. I got, I'm in control. 
frontal cortex go. Another thing is what's interesting is what, what you're watching. You know, I, I don't know, I may be a total nerd, but I went to Iron Man 3 and I left because I was offended. And I watch people and they're like, that was the best movie. I'm like, what about all those naked girls? What naked girls? Hmm. Interesting. So I have a different threshold now. And I'm super glad about it because, man, it is so amazing to have control. I do not want my wife to be confused with my motorcycle. You see, that's what happens in pornographic minds. Objects become people. People become objects. I cannot afford that. I have three daughters. I cannot afford that. I need to view all girls as daughters of the Heavenly Father. And I got to work diligent to get there. And that's what's fascinating to me. And that's the end of my presentation. And we only have two minutes left. I so wanted questions. Maybe we can bust it out real quick if you have any questions. Otherwise, we'll just call it. We got probably a minute. Yes? Depression is the same concept. It's how you learn to process stress. And many times with depression, you learn to process the wrong way. So you go to areas of your brain that are not healthy. And we avoid those things by sleeping instead of facing them. And we go what I call red roads and blue roads. Red roads will take you to a process where you'll become negative and depressed. And then you just span off of that and you become more and more and more negative. And nobody can cheer you up. It's very interesting and it's a processing disorder of the brain. That's what all of these things are with that same concept. So when, you're, so when um, the person decides to break an addiction or to get away from it, um, the brain has coped and dealt with things for so long in that way. I mean, as they start to break away from it, what are the consequences? What are the oh, with, that's what that's what withdrawal, anger, depression, anxiety, tired. It's, it's the same kinds of withdrawals you can expect to see on people you've watched on TV they are trying to come off of drugs. You can even get physically sweating and shaking from coming off of these addictions because your brain craves it. What happens when you're hungry? What does your brain tell you to do? Eat. Can you imagine if you're coming off and you says, what is your brain telling you to do? You've got to look at that picture and you're saying no. And you have a limited resource on how much you can withstand. The key to that chocolate chip experiment, how do you withstand that? Get out of the room. Get out of the room quick. Move the cookies, smash them, throw them away, spit on them, have somebody lick them, do anything <laughs> to say those are no longer attractive to me and get out. You cannot simply sit and say, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm surfing the internet, I'm fine, I'm not doing anything bad, I'm fine, that chocolate chip cookie aroma is going to your nose, I'm starting to crave a little bit, I'm fine, and then bam. You cannot do that. Do not play with fire like that. You can't withstand it. One more question. So you talked about like desensitization. Uh, yeah, desensitization. Is there a way that, to resensitize? Is that these guys? That's what's so neat about the brain is if you will start doing different types of behaviors, those neurons, instead of being connected, they withdraw. You can, you can correct it. And Christ, if he can take a blind man from birth and restore the neural networks in the brain and eyes, he can restore the neural networks in your brain as well. That's what the atonement is. But we must make an effort, but sure. That's what's so cool about the brain. Complete reversal. So what's the difference between that and what happens for two years on a mission? Two years on a mission, you're not partaking of it, but you haven't... You, the difference, if you, that's a good question. If you come back off a mission and you don't go back to your old ways, you will be on this upward path where you will eliminate it eventually. So healing, is happening on the mission. healing happens on the mission. Healing, yes. Part of the problem is that when you're back in mission, you don't do what Brother Hunt said. So remember, he said first thing is eliminate. When you're back in mission, you end up in your old room, you're a 17 year old boy again, and you got your laptop. So the problem is you're actually not doing the avoidance, the restructuring, the anchoring, and the contributing behaviors. You're actually sliding back. So that dormant part goes light again. And another thing that wasn't mentioned, this takes time. You, this is the best analogy, weight loss. If you want to lose weight, you cannot do it in a month. How long does it take? Years. 
And then worse, if you want to keep the weight off, what have you got to do? You got to keep living like that. And so many people with late weight loss create extreme diets that are not sustainable. You must create a sustainable way of living. And if you create the sustainable way of living, you will not go back to it.